Hi, I'm Ken Riley, pastor of Hewitt Community Church, and I want to thank you for taking the time to visit with us today. If you're inspired by what you see or by what you hear, or you'd like to know more about Hewitt Community Church, then please visit our website, hewittcc.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our very first ever online Wednesday night Bible study. This Bible study represents a continuing effort on our part to stay connected to you, moreover, to keep you encouraged, which comes through God's Word. Now, tonight, we are going to be starting a study entitled Living the Good Life, and this is going to be a, a, a Bible study dedicated to Paul's letter to Titus. Let me begin by saying that some of the material that I'm going to bring to you tonight is very, very much the same material that I brought to you on our first online Wednesday, a Sunday night Bible study on March the 22nd. Nevertheless, I felt that this was pertinent and relevant to us as a church family, and so I hope that you will indulge me. Okay, let's do this. Why don't we begin by praying? On, if we were meeting on a regular Wednesday night, we would first pray over God's Word. And, and so why don't you join me? Let, let's do that right now. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we come to you in the name of Christ, and um, we, we just depend upon you. Through this separation, while it may have profound effects on us mentally and spiritually and emotionally, it is your word that keeps us grounded. It is your word that keeps us connected. It, it is your word that keeps us sane. And so this evening, I ask two things of you. First of all, Lord, I, I ask that you would anoint me. I, I confess, I, I don't like teaching in front of a camera. I, I would much rather be engaged with the people of Hewitt Community Church today. I, I'd much rather be in the fellowship hall and, and, and talking and laughing uh, with this church family that I, I love so much. And so it's hard for me. And so I, I need your anointing and I need your help. But Lord, also I ask that you would anoint and prepare and open the hearts of those that are listening tonight, that they will receive the seed of your word, not because it comes from my mouth, but because it comes from you. And they, they will recognize that it comes from you. And in coming from you, it will be pertinent and relevant to their lives. Bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I think I feel a little better now. Many of you know that Teresa loves Christmas. She loves Christmas so much that, and I've shared this before, she plays Christmas music in her office all year long. Not only does she like Christmas music, but she also likes Christmas music movies. And among one of her favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life, which is a, a staple at Christmas time. I like the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Did you know that the movie It's a Wonderful Life is rated by the American <clears throat> Film Institute <clears throat> as one of the 100 best films of all time? It's number 11 on their list. By the way, have you ever wondered what's number one on their list? It's not Gone with the Wind. It's not The Wizard of Oz. It's Citizen Kane. I don't really get that. Oh, well. If you've never seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life, or if you're not familiar with the storyline, let me give you a little bit of a synopsis. It's about this guy named George Bailey who grew up in a, a small town, but he had, his whole life had dreamed of travel and adventure. Nevertheless, he found himself repeatedly sacrificing that dream for the sake of other people. Years later, through no fault of his own, he finds himself broken and, and defeated by life, so much so that he is contemplating suicide. And, and it's at that point that Clarence, his guardian angel, shows up. And he intervenes by giving George, a vision of what his life and what his town would have been like 
had he never been born. It is through that intervention that George realizes that his life mattered and that he truly had lived a wonderful life, not necessarily through the adventures that he'd experienced or the money that he had made, but through the lives that he had touched over the years. Well, in many ways, that's the motivation behind Paul's letter to Titus. I want to begin by having you notice Paul's objective in writing to Titus. That's in Titus 1.1, where he says, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In other words, Paul's objective was to help believers like you and me achieve godliness. Now, in this context, godliness loosely translated means prosperity. And so another way that you could say Titus 1.1 is this, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to prosperity. Now, just to clarify, Paul is not referring to financial prosperity. He is referring to spiritual or soul prosperity. Paul is talking about how that we can carve a pathway to abundant living or what we've often talked about here at HCC, Zoe living. Zoe living is defined as abundant living in every category of life, in your health, in your emotions, in your spiritual life, in your marriage, in your family, in your children, in your business. And that's the kind of life that I believe God wants for his people. Uh, That's John 10.10, where Jesus himself said, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying or Zoe life. Well, how is this rich, satisfying, prosperous, godly life attained? Well, Paul says in Titus 1.1 that it is through our knowledge of the truth. In other words, the truth of God's word and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, how does the truth of God's word and the truth of the gospel prosper us spiritually? Well, the Bible says that it prospers us spiritually by sanctifying us. Let me take you to John 17, 17. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Uh, That word sanctify there, it means to cleanse, to set free, to exonerate, to renew. And, And that's exactly what the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It makes our lives prosperous. It makes our lives rich and satisfying by cleansing us and freeing us and exonerating us and renewing us. Now that said... The Christian life can be a challenge. While it can be a challenge in any setting, it is especially challenging in an environment where people are untrustworthy, they are violent, they are lazy, and they are self-indulgent. And and that is exactly the setting that you have for the book of Titus. Notice Titus 1.12. I referred to this the other Sunday. Titus 1.12, it says, One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Now, to fully appreciate this statement that Paul is making here, let me back up and give you a little bit of history here. Uh, The Bible makes no specific mention of it, but evidently at some point, Paul and Titus had paid a visit to the island of Crete, and uh, that's one of the Greek islands, and they had preached the gospel there evidently, and some people had been saved, and a church was planted. And it was decided that Titus would remain in Crete in order to um, raise up church leaders who could take over the leadership of this church. Uh, Titus 1.5 confirms that, where Paul writes, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. Well, the inference from Titus 1.12 is that Titus, in raising up leadership for this newly planted church, he didn't have much to work with. But that's the greatness of the gospel. The gospel says it can take a lazy, 
gluttonous, violent liar, and it can transform him into a godly, disciplined, peacemaking, peace-loving, productive person, useful for the kingdom of God. If it can happen to a Cretan, then it can happen in Hewitt. Okay, so let's get started. Titus 1, 1 through 4. Let's read through this. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Okay, so in his greeting here to Titus, Paul describes himself in two distinct ways. First of all, he describes himself as a servant of God. And then secondly, he describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I want to talk once again about those two terms. First is that term servant of God. In his letter to Titus, this is the only place where Paul will describe himself in this particular way. And the word servant is more accurately translated as slave, as slave of God. Uh, That is a terminology that goes back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, that term servant or slave was often reserved for prophets of the Lord. For example, and I mentioned this the other day, uh, Joshua 1, in in that passage, uh, Moses is referred to as a servant or as a slave of the Lord. And then later on in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua himself takes on that title. Well, in like manner, Paul is identifying himself as a servant or a slave of God, and by doing so, He is linking himself to his ancestry. You may remember me talking about the gold pocket watch that's currently in my house. It's on display in my house. And and you may may have heard me mention how that that watch was given to me or was given to me by my dad. It was given to him uh, by my grandfather. Uh, Someday, Lord willing, I'm, I'm probably going to give it to Graham. But keep in mind, Graham has no memory of my grandfather. Graham never met my grandfather. He has no personal connection to him. He he has no emotional connection to them. Therefore, the responsibility rests upon my shoulders that before I hand that pocket watch over to Graham, then the first thing I'm going to do is impress upon him how valuable that pocket watch is. how how much it matters, how important it is to him as a person, not necessarily because of monetary value, but because that pocket watch represents a link to his past. The men who owned that watch before him were men who all played a formative role in who Graham is, the, the Riley men in part, are responsible for his physical appearance and his personality and his intelligence and his talents. The Riley men, in part, contributed this to Graham. And therefore, it's important that Graham understand and that he will be taught that that pocket watch is to be valued and to cherish by him uh, because it is, was cherished and valued by the ancestors before him. Moreover, he's going to be taught that someday it's going to be his responsibility to teach that same value to the descendants that come after him. Well, Paul, by identifying himself as a servant or as a slave of God, he is identifying himself as one in a long line of men and women who've been entrusted with the family heirloom of God's Word. I don't think that I can overemphasize this. And having been entrusted with God's Word, 
he understands full well the expectation which rests upon him to value and to cherish and protect God's word while it is in his custody and the responsibility which rests upon him, the expectation which rests upon him to teach his descendants who will someday inherit God's word to value and cherish and protect it for themselves. And so that's what that terminology, servant of God, represents. And and I hope that as you're thinking about that at home, and as you're thinking of yourself as a servant of God, that that same kind of philosophy, that same kind of ideal will be resonating with you. You have been entrusted with a family heirloom, the family heirloom of God's word. Then that takes us to Paul's second terminology in describing himself. He describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, that term apostle can be translated as as messenger or delegate or, or one sent forth with orders. And in this context, an apostle is a person of authority. An apostle is someone with whom respect is owed. But the respect is not in the person himself. The respect is in the message. It is the message that warrants respect. Through this declaration, Paul is setting himself apart from from false teachers. Um, The early New Testament church, as you probably know, was being infested at this time with, with false teachers people who were attempting to either prefer or to modify the gospel to meet their own agenda for their own purpose. And in Jude 1.4, Paul described these people in this way. He said, they are people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. In other words, he was saying that false teachers are people who do nothing more than teach what they feel. And the problem with teaching what you feel is that feelings change. But an apostle is one who has been delegated to go out with the same proclamation wherever he goes. There is an authority in that proclamation because it never changes. There is a respect that should be given to that proclamation because it never changes. And in Paul's case... What is the proclamation that never changes? It is the proclamation that the knowledge of truth, that the more that we know of God's word, the more that God's word is implanted in us, it will, guaranteed, lead us to godliness. It will prosper us spiritually. And so you might say that in this twofold description of himself, Paul is reaching with one hand into the past. He is reaching with the other hand into the future. And through his letter to Titus, that is what he is challenging you and I to do as well. Paul is entrusting Titus, but moreover, he is trusting you and me with the precious family heirloom of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is he doing so? Well, number one, because It is the link to your past. God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, it tells you where you've come from. It tells you of all of the men and the women that that sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears to bring you and I to where you are today. It's our Christian heritage. But moreover, it is what's propelling you into the future. In other words, there's still work to be done. There are still sacrifices which need to be made. There is a price which still needs to be paid. And God is looking to you and he's looking to me to pay it. Isaiah 60 verse 1, it says, Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Isaiah 60 verse 1 is an inspirational verse, but it's not necessarily about receiving some awesome spiritual experience. It is about getting up and getting to work. There are some sermons to preach and there are some lessons to teach. And how well 
the next generation learns those lessons is to a great extent going to depend upon how responsibly you handled the precious family heirloom of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the reason why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, he says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. Through the grace and the mercy and the generous provision of God, through the perseverance and the sacrifice of the slaves of God in your past, you have been given a solid, firm foundation. But now it is your turn. It's your responsibility to build up on that foundation. And you'd better take care that you do it well because the Bible says that one day is going to be put to the test. And while passing the test or failing the test will have some what of a bearing on you, the person that it is going to impact the most is the one that comes after you. And so the question is, how do I build upon that foundation? How do I fulfill my responsibility to further the faith of, of God's people, to extend the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness to my children and of my grandchildren? How do I fulfill my responsibility to them? Well, Paul tells us in one th Titus 1.3, he says, through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of of God our Savior. The family heirloom of God's word is cherished and valued and protected and passed down through preaching. Preaching what? Well, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now let me explain why that's important. Let me explain where Paul is going here. The time frame for Paul's letter is about 60 to 75 years after Christ. Up to this point, the apostles of Christ and Paul himself had been the driving force behind the spread of the gospel. Moreover, they had fiercely and passionately defended and protected the integrity of the gospel, not allowing anyone to in any way and in any detail modify, add, or subtract to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had been for the, all these years, the undisputed authority of the church. And do you know why? Because they had been with Jesus. They had personally seen him. They had talked with him and walked with him and eaten with him and had worked beside him. And because that they had been with Jesus, they were the undisputed authority. Nobody could challenge them. But here they are 65, 70 years later, they're getting on in years. Some of them have already passed on, and the rest of them realize they have very little time yet left. Uh, Paul himself is probably sensing that his time is short. And so now he is preparing to hand over the precious family heirloom of the gospel to a new generation. But just like Graham, who's never met my grandfather, he's handing it over to a generation that has not seen Christ. This is a generation that wasn't there when he fed the 5,000. This is a generation that wasn't there when he preached the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. They weren't there when he healed the sick. They weren't there when he walked on water. They weren't there when he raised Lazarus back to life after four days in the grave. They weren't there to see his transfiguration. How can you ever hope to pass Christ on to a future generation without having seen him or experienced him personally? Paul says it's through preaching. That word preaching means to speak with formality, 
but to also speak with gravity and, and with authority. You heard me describe preaching like this the other Sunday. You know how on a cold day, as I'm recording this today, uh, it's a very cold Saturday morning. And you know how on a, on a cold day like today, if you're outside, you can, you can see that vapor come out of your mouth or come out of your nostrils. And, and that vapor that you see and that everybody else around you sees, it is the undisputed evidence that there is life inside of you. Well, well, preaching is like that. In preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, Jesus Christ takes shape. He takes form. He, he materializes. Preaching is the undisputed evidence that He lives, that He lives inside of you, and that His words live inside of you. It is through preaching that people experience Jesus Christ firsthand. You and I are simply one link in that chain. James 4.4 4 says, What is your life? You are a mist that peers for a little while and then vanishes. I hate to admit it, but James is, is absolutely right. Life is short, but a short life doesn't have to mean a meaningless life. There's the story of a lady by the name of Hewitt Clark. She was an heiress who died in 2011, just two weeks shy of her 105th birthday. She died with a net worth of over $300 million dollars. And yet she chose to die in a small hospital room, which incidentally is where she had lived for the last 20 years of her life, while her multiple mansions sat empty. She is quoted as having said, money is poison. Her life, though comparatively long, was evidently miserable and empty. We are not guaranteed 105 years. We are not guaranteed more than five minutes. But that doesn't mean that our lives can't be good. It doesn't mean that they can't be meaningful. It doesn't mean that our lives can't be wonderful. Moreover, when used properly, our lives can be instrumental in making the lives of others wonderful as well. How? in telling them that God is good, in telling them that He is a providing God and a protecting God and a saving God. That is the message that has been handed down to us. And now it is the message that we are expected to pass down to others. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank You for Your Word. It is truly wonderful. It is the power of your word, the life in your word, that gives passion to me. Even when I start talking about it and thinking about it, so much so that I'm able to preach to a camera instead of to a live audience. That's remarkable. Because it's not me, it's you. And that's what I prayed at the beginning of this prayer time or this, or this Bible study time, isn't it? I prayed that you would anoint me. I prayed that you would use me. And Lord, I'm, I'm so honored to be used. Not necessarily so that I can talk to people online, but because I am proud of this precious heirloom that has been passed down to me. I'm honored that you would see fit to pass down this precious family heirloom of your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would see fit to make me a servant or a slave that would bear this good news. But moreover, I am honored that I'm being used as an apostle to speak this word out, 
a word of authority, a word to be respected. Why? Because it never changes. You are a God who never changes. You always love us. You're always available to us. And you're always willing to forgive us. That is the message of Christ. That is Christ materialized. And it is a message that we need to remember for ourselves. But we also need to pass it on. Even during this time where we're separated from one another. Lord, therefore I ask that you would use us to be messages and to be proponents of the gospel. That we would understand yet again the precious family heirloom that we possess and that we would commit ourselves to passing it on to those that come after us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that your word will once again resonate in the hearts of your people. Not just so we can say that we've heard it, Not just so we can say we've learned something, but so that we can take it and we can do something with it. We can act upon it for your purpose and for your kingdom and for your glory. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this technology that makes it possible for your word to go forth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you'd like more information about Hewitt Community Church, then visit our website at hewittcc.org. And if you'd like, you can give by clicking on the button in the upper right-hand corner. But most importantly, remember, if you've been blessed in any capacity from God's Word, then you are automatically obligated to be a blessing to those around you.